Uh, so you're running for Labour leader. That's right. You've got four nominations for MPs so far. One of those is yourself. Mm. It's not looking great, is it? Oh, look, clearly, I wish, um, I wish my mum could nominate me as well. That would be fantastic, wouldn't it? Um, but I not think... Not quite in the rules. No, not, not quite in the rules. Look, um, it's hard. And I think some of the things that I'm saying aren't necessarily things which everyone, after a devastating defeat, want to hear. But the reality is, unless we transform ourselves as a party, um, transform how we organise, transform the culture of our party, stop the tribalism within our party, uh, we won't be able to win in the next five years. And I think if you understand that it's democracy that has to be at the heart of everything we do as a party, so that we can be the change that we want to see in the rest of the country, then that means some quite radical changes to how we operate. It means that we need to, for example, cooperate with other political parties. We have to embrace proportional representation and radical constitutional reform. These are things that the Labour Party will have to do if it wants any chance of being able to reconnect and work with other parties to be able to win a general election yeah. in five years' time. What kind of policies in particular do you think aren't going down so well with your colleagues then? But I think, look, if you're going to talk about radical democracy, radical constitutional democracy... What does that mean? Case, so, for example, reform of the House of Lords, devolution, uh, embracing proportional representation, um, enabling a, conven a, con a constitutional convention so that the public can actually have a say over the kind of state that we live in, the kind of voting system that we have. It's about letting people have real say and real agency over their lives. Now, if you're going to say that for the country, you also have to ensure that you as a party are also walking the walk. And that means things like, for example, uh, allowing local CLPs to decide whether they stand candidates in the general election. These are things like, for example, whether you want Scotland and Wales to have a say over whether they're going to uh, call for a second independence refer referendum in Scotland, uh, and will they support it? I you mean, these are things allowing people and localities to have real say in power. You talk a lot about party <clears throat> democracy and empowering conference in particular. Well, one of the things that people at conference uh, voted for was abolishing private schools. Do you think that should be Labour Party policy? Yes, I do. Um, I think if you understand that private schools are an engine of inequality and of how they operate, I understand that lots of people out there send their children to private school for a variety of reasons. And there are many schools, there are, private, there are private schools in my own constituency where I go and talk to the students, and those schools are fantastic. But I would like that standard for every child in this country. It shouldn't just be determined by the fact that you have the money to be able to pay for your child to have that quality of education. It should be available to everyone. And I think that division within our society at such an early age has consequences for the inequality that we have, not just in terms of wealth, but power as well. And I think that's a very, I think it was a very good policy. And I think it's one that could be communicated, perhaps uh, in a better way. But ultimately, yes, I do support it. Uh, on Friday, talking about referendums, democracy, on Friday, you said uh, about the royal family, we can just put the quote in the wall. Why not have a referendum in this country on the future of the royal family? We're a democracy. I'd rather see us as citizens and subjects. So would you like to see a referendum on the future of the royal family? So what you'll see in um, the manifesto that we've launched go. today, and which, which camera, this one, tra <laughs> Transform to Win, we're, one of the key things we're talking in here is about a, a constitutional convention. And that would look at things like devolution, House of Lords, um, uh, the, the makeup of how we actually vote, proportional representation. And, you know, we live in the 21st century now. And I think that if you're going to allow people a real say over the kind of country they want to live in, it may well be at one of those uh, constitutional conventions that people actually say, we'd like to talk about the entirety of the state. And that could well include the royal family, what size it is, what its function is. I think we've seen this week there is a great love for the royal family in this country, but there's also, I think, some concerns about how it will go forward into the future. And I think giving people real power, real agency, a real say over their lives, if people wanted to have that referendum, then that would be up to How'd them. But I think... How would you vote if there was a referendum? Would you vote for it to be scrapped? <clears throat> I'd listen to the debate, um, and I'd what like to hear... What's your personal view? I'm a Republican. I'm a Republican. Um, so I believe like see I'm a citizen. Well, I think maybe moderated, maybe changed, but I actually want to be a citizen in this country, not a subject. I want to have real say, real power. I want my, I want my community to have real say, real power over its lives. I think it's entirely acceptable. There are people in this life, there are democracies all over the world where they do not have a royal family. But that shouldn't be for me uh, as leader or as prime minister one day to dictate what happens. That should be for the people of this country to have a say. Um, I keen to talk about Brexit, clearly a big uh, issue uh, in the last uh, general election. Uh, now, in 2019, uh, you tweeted this uh, in response to an attack on the activist and columnist Owen Jones. You said, 
Welcome to Brexit Britain. To be frank, I've had enough of this reactionary right-wing and racist endeavour. We need to end it now. Yeah. Do you think Brexit is a racist endeavour? I think part of the Brexit uh, campaign and part of the undertone of Brexit from some politicians, Nigel Farage and others, had racism at its core, at its heart. They used it as a mechanism to divide our communities, to divide our country. And one of the things about do you being... Think, but do you think Brexit is a racist endeavour? Which I, is what you say. But, you but, but, but if you think about moving away, there's a potential for Brexit, and I think we've seen it. You know, how many, how many people of colour, how many black people, on the day after the referendum, woke up with a sense of dread because of what had happened? Ultimately, our country had chosen to listen to Boris Johnson, someone who has a track record of racist commentary, of giving credence to racism, uh, to, to Nigel Farage, someone who stood in front of a poster which was overtly racist. This was a government that had the Windrush scandal, that had, had go-home vans. So I think for anyone to say that there was not an element of racism in the, bro in the Brexit project as an endeavour, you're, you're basically wrong. And I think you can see that. And I think ask the millions of black people in this country who understood what much of the dog whistle politics and tone was on this issue, then I think you understand that was complete. Now, that doesn't mean that every single person that voted for Brexit is a racist. Some of my family voted for Brexit. But I think that there were drivers within that campaign which certainly were very unsavoury and what I would call racist. I spent yesterday in Crewe in Nantwich with the uh, former MP, Laura Smith, who lost her seat at the mm. election, and she said that Brexit was a huge issue in that area, yeah. the voting area, and a big reason why Labour lost that seat. Do you think comments like yours are part of the problem? No, because I think unless you're honest and truthful about what uh, Brexit was about, there are lots of reasons. Take back control meant many different things to, some, to people. For some people, it was about taking back control of the immigration system. For some people, it was about taking back control of their lives, taking back control of allowing us to spend more money on the NHS, whatever the reason was that they believed it. But my comments, and I think now um, the future of the Labour Party is up and at stake, I think one of the key things for myself and many others in the party is that we don't want to see our party uh, triangulate on the issue of racism. What the challenge now is for our country is what kind of country do we want to be? Do we want to be an inward-looking, closed-minded, xenophobic country? Or do we want to be an outward-looking, tolerant and open country? And do you know what? If people have racist views, it's the job of the Labour Party to challenge them and explain to them that there is a different way of going about things. And actually, it's about bringing our communities together, not separating them and dividing them. And my fear is, in the future, that's what the Conservative government will try to do. It will try to bed in and, and divide communities using awful uh, kinds of uh, negative English nationalism to try and divide people apart. We don't want to see that. And the Labour Party must be a force for good in this country. Um, while we've got you, uh, at a campaign event in Brixton this week, you suggested that structural racism could be part of the reason you haven't won support from your colleagues. You said it's possible to be in the parliamentary Labour Party and be sexist and be racist in some ways as part of these structural issues. Mm. Do I think that's the only reason that I'm on the nominations that I am? No. I think it's more complex, but do you think racism is part of the reason you've only got four nominations? I guess the question I would, I would turn back on you is why do we think there hasn't been a woman, a female leader of the Labour Party? And I, I would say answer the question for that because of that is because we have something called structural uh, sexism within our society. We have structural sexism and we have structural racism. Do I think that if you go to the PLP and speak to the men that they are uh, overtly sexist? No, I don't. Just as I don't believe they're overtly racist. But these issues, these themes run through our society. Um, we, can see overtly, it with, we can perhaps. see it We can see it with Meghan Markle and the, the way that she's been treated in the media. We know that this is a reality of the 21st century still. After 400 years of racism, you can't just overturn it overnight. It's something that we're going to have to work on. But structural sexism, structural racism exists within our society. And the PLP, the Labour Party, is part of that society. And it's for us to challenge that and to make sure that we do better. I've never said that it's because of my colour that I'm uh, not being nominated by my um, parliamentary colleagues. But what I was saying was, if you want to understand why we haven't had a woman, why we haven't had a person of colour as the leader of the Labour Party, then we have to look at the entirety of the issue, which is that those uh, structural uh, issues do exist. Now, I've been told that I have to wrap the interview, but I just want to ask something really, really quickly before I do, sorry. Um, if you don't make it through, who are you going to back for leader? I think I'll listen to what they say. I hope... Uh, if I'm not in it myself, I hope that many of the candidates will listen to what we've put forward. We'll take a look at the manifesto, Transform to Change. Will you, will you tell me? Well, I want to hear, so at the moment, I haven't heard very much coming from any of the okay. candidates. So okay. let's hear what they've got to say. 